Okay, well, let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer and invite the Lord into our time. Welcome everyone, including those I haven't had a chance to say hello to yet. God bless you. Thank you for being here. And um, let's invite the Lord in and we'll get started on our study today. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us here to study your word. And Lord, I pray that you will open up your word to us so that we may see it clearly and understand exactly what you're trying to communicate to us. Lord, some of the details we may not be real clear on, but as far as what you're communicating in the word of God, we believe it, Lord. There's nothing that we have to question on anything that comes from you. So Lord, if there is something that we are interpreting incorrectly, I ask that you will show us that we may hold to the truth, Lord. We don't want to compromise the truth at all, and we certainly don't want to go off in a direction of speculation and opinion, because none of that matters when it comes to your word. So thank you, Lord. I pray you'll bless this time, and I pray that you will bless each person that's here, keep them healthy and strong, and please continue to draw them closer to you each and every day, Lord. We pray this to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, last time we took a look at some of the verses in Daniel that pertain to this abomination of desolation. And, um, you know, it's pretty clear what that little term means. But first of all, the fact that it's an abomination means that in the eyes of God and anything holy, what we're referring to here as far as the Antichrist establishing his throne in the temple of God is an abomination in the eyes of God. Secondly, it causes desolation because of the timing of this and because it happens during the second half of the tribulation period, it's already a time of judgment upon the world. So it's not just the work of the Antichrist that we see coming into play here. The Antichrist is going to be all about persecuting Christians and Jews, especially the Jews, because it's going to be during this time period that Scripture says that the Jews will finally receive their Savior. Their eyes have been blinded ever since they rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And according to Paul, their eyes will remain blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles has come into the church, which hasn't happened yet. But I believe that we're nearing an end to that, which means we're nearing an end to the church age and the age of grace. Which means that people can still be saved, but it won't be by grace and mercy. It'll be through trials and tribulation of the great tribulation and the tribulation. The word of God says that this will be a period of time unlike any other time in history. The things that people will see will be things that no one ever has ever seen before, including the heavens sending forth everything from meteors to the darkening of the sun and the moon, all kinds of changes, even weather pattern changes. What we're seeing right now is just a taste. There's actually also going to be a poison called wormwood that is going to destroy the whole fresh water system. There'll be rising tides because 
of the melting of the polar ice caps. It's going to be a day of wrath and judgment. And then on top of that, it's going to be a day where the Antichrist, after three and a half years of relative peace and prosperity on earth, will completely change. And it'll be a time that he is out to destroy any Christian and any Jew in order to prevent the Jews from being saved. Now we know that God is sovereign. So any attempts on the part of the enemy or anyone else, of course, will not succeed. But we know these days will be horrible days. It'll make the days of the flood and the days of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah seem like playtime in comparison. This will affect everyone on earth. It'll affect the heavens. It'll affect the earth. It'll affect the water. It'll affect everything. In fact, I'm going to show you a couple of verses in Revelation 16 to show you how bad it's going to get. And the amazing thing about that is the heart of man will still not repent. Jesus talks about a day when man's heart will become stone cold. And that's going to be the day. This is why, though this is an extensive study, we're starting with what happened with the enemy. So that we can see that his falling from grace was willful. And it was the very beginning of everything that we're currently seeing today and what we will see in the days or years or months ahead, however much time we have left. But the Lord himself is warning us. You'd never guess it by looking around the world and what's going on in the world. But he warns us with that warning. There will be, there will have been absolutely nothing like it that has ever happened in this world. That is what is yet to come. So yes, while the flood wiped out the whole earth except for eight people, what people are going to experience in that day is a combination of the wrath of God and the destructive power of the enemy, in particular against Jews and Christians. It's certainly a day to prepare for, right? If there's anybody in this world that's not prepared for it, there's no one to blame but themselves. Because the warnings from Christ are already 2,000 years old. But most people, just like those that are completely dead spiritually, are indifferent and unmoved by the realities of what's coming. They still think that since a God, since our God is a God of love, that God is just going to look the other way and give everyone a pass so that they will not have to spend eternity in hell on top of it. Well, let me give you some assurance on that. 
before we go any further. The Lord will not take a look at any single man or woman in this world during that period of time and willfully and intentionally turn his head and blind his eye to what's going on. Thereby giving either the whole world or whoever he chooses a free pass into heaven. Especially after they've ignored him their whole lifetime. And there's a definitive reason why I know the Lord would never do that. And that would be because it would make a mockery of the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, the reason why the only one that could have been a savior or the savior was Jesus was for a very specific reason. Scripture is clear to tell us that it cannot be a man or a woman from this world. Because there isn't a single man or woman in this world that has not sinned and rebelled against a holy God. How can a sinner, sinner be the savior of anyone when they can't even save themselves? We also know that it's not by works, it's not by good deeds, it's not by the law, and it's not by religion. Jesus and the apostles made that abundantly clear. So if the Father sent the Son to the cross to atone for the sin of man and do more than that, which is to impute his own righteousness to us since we have no righteousness of our own. Then how could God turn his back on his own son and say, because of him, I'm a God of love. I'll overlook all of that and save people anyhow. That would be making a mockery of the cross. And according to man, that's no big deal. But according to God, that is everything. So why did Jesus need to come and be the one crucified in the first place? Well, we've already mentioned part of that reason. And that's because there is not one single righteous human being walking this earth, nor has there been from the time of Adam and Eve, nor will there be in the future. There's not one that's righteous. Romans 3 is very clear about that. There is not one single man or woman, chapter 3, verse 10, that is righteous. There is only one who is righteous. And that's our Savior, our Lord, and our, our Messiah. Which is why his righteousness must be imputed to the elect of God Otherwise, even though Jesus is going to, has gone to the cross, shed his blood, atoned for our sin, you and I would still be standing before the Lord and not be able to come into his presence because you and I cannot offer him one single righteous day. of our lives 
Not one. Not even one hour of one day. So it's not just the atoning of our sin and covering it with the very blood of Christ, the innocent lamb of God. Who knew no sin. That only addresses the sin part. But what happens when it comes time to stand before the Lord himself? And you and I cannot point to one single day in a lifetime that we can be declared righteous on our own. How do we know that? Well, in our first day of study, we looked at Romans 7. And Paul himself calls himself a wretched man. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? Yes, you can be born again. Yes, you can be saved. Yes, you can be spirit-filled. But without the righteousness of Jesus Christ, you and I cannot stand before a holy and righteous God. It's not that we'll have any sin that is not covered, but we also have no righteousness. But God is all righteousness. We couldn't even come into his presence. So how could God make a decision like just letting anybody in because he's a God of love. Well, he can't. Because the atonement was bought at a price. The life, the death, and the shedding of blood of the innocent Lamb of God. On our behalf as a substitute. As our substitute, he took the wrath and the judgment of God upon himself, the same judgment that was due to you and I. He took it. And he hung on that cross. And for three hours of the time he hung on the cross, it was complete darkness. Many theologians believe that that was the period of time that God imputed the sins of the elect onto the shoulders of Jesus Christ. Though he never sinned. He became sin. And for that reason, the Father could not even look. But immediately, Jesus breathed his last. And God the Father tore the temple curtain in two from top to bottom, thereby opening up the way into the Holy of Holies, meaning into the very presence of God, because through Jesus Christ, for the first time in our lives, we are actually declared righteous. Not through our own righteousness, but through that of Jesus Christ. 
Now, knowing that, how could God just open up the door to anyone? We already said man and women, men and women could not possibly atone. Even if they're born again, they can't atone because they're still sinning. It's only when the flesh is finally put in the ground that it's finally over. And the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit will be complete. Then we will be ready for our glorified bodies. But not until then. Sin has corrupted man through and through. The enemy, knowing the scriptures, already knows how it's going to end. He's just trying to take as many down with him as possible. This is why we have to be ready for spiritual war. Do you think he's going to hold the door open for us? It'll be a battle to the end. But it's not going to be much of a battle if our only weapon. The sword of the spirit is sitting on a desk somewhere collecting dust. We need to be reading it. We need to be studying it. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we have to be living it. Everything else that Ephesians 6 refers to is just armor. It's defensive in nature. And it's intended to just extinguish the firing darts of the enemy. But none of it's a weapon. The only thing that's the weapon is the sword of the spirit. But what good does that do anybody if they don't know it? And if they're not reading it and studying it regularly and by the power of the Holy Spirit applying it, what good does it do? This is why I keep pointing out the condition of the physical church. The physical church has now made it optional for the people to even bring a Bible. Some of them don't even have Bibles in there anymore. I don't need to hear anything a preacher or a teacher has got to tell me if they're not even using the word of God as the reference. Because all they're giving me is their opinion, which is worthless to a soul that's dying and corrupted by sin. I think it's in the book of Habakkuk. There's a reference to a famine in the land. But the famine isn't because of food. The famine is the truth from the word of God. There's going to come a day that man is going to be looking for it. And they're not going to be able to find it. And quite possibly, part of the reason for that would be because 
with all the different translations that there are now. The truth of God's word has been corrupted. As we speak, China, of all countries, is rewriting a different version of the scripture. Something that everyone can buy into. Something that's not so Christian. That other religions can accept as well. That's the fuel for the one world religion. And it's being formed as we speak. When you've got the Catholic Church, Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, even Jews, all willing to compromise what they believe. So as to unify in the faith, not to unify in a relationship with the true God, but to unify in the faith, or unify in mankind, rather. Multitudes of people are going to be shocked. Just because man approves of something, and just because man decides to use that as, as a means of their own salvation, means nothing to a holy God. For our holy God will hold up his word. Jesus is the word of God incarnate. The gospel of John says in chapter one, he is the word of God. I can assure you, the Lord will not accept anything that mankind or the physical church or anyone else comes up with. That will make us acceptable in the sights of God, other than what has already been done. And since man is rejecting that, we talked about this on Tuesday in 2 Thessalonians, that since man is not real happy about that and they're quick to kick that aside by kicking it aside, they are leaving themselves no way by which they may be saved. That's the condition of mankind as we speak. And we're disposing of the word of God? And we've got religions and religious leaders telling men and women how to live, but they're not walking any closer to the Lord than the rest of the world is? That's like the blind leading the blind. When people find out, which they could if they would just read their Bibles, but when people find out that God is not going to turn his back on the cross of Christ, in order to bring in these multitudes of people who are following a dead religion, They will be shocked to see that he's going to send them away. And they're having turned away from the Father, from the Son, 
and from the word of God, it will leave them no other way by which they may be saved. Which is why God himself sends that strong delusion because these people are beyond repentance. They're beyond salvation. They've rejected, through apostasy, they have rejected the truth. Well, once you reject the truth, what's left? There's nothing left. So in the midst of all of that, as we've been looking, we've got the enemy who has rebelled against God from the very beginning. Before man even appeared on earth, the enemy was already here. And the enemy is out to deceive. And he's having his way. And the majority of people have nothing to say about it. But a day is coming soon that all the end times related things, including the desecration of the temple, a temple which must be built Because the last temple standing was destroyed in AD 70. Another temple will need to be built. And the Antichrist will desecrate that temple by establishing his throne there and claiming himself to be God. That is why those last three and a half years called the Great Tribulation, not just the Tribulation, but the Great Tribulation are going to be like hell on earth. You've got the enemy that's going to play all kinds of havoc because the enemy is the power behind the Antichrist. But beyond that, You've got the wrath and the judgment of God being poured out in three different sets of judgment. The seal judgment, the trumpet judgment, and the bowl judgment. And every single one of those is going to be worse than the one before it. That's all going to happen in three and a half years. What we're experiencing today are still the birthing pains. So what I'd like to do with the remainder of our time is to go back to a couple of these passages we were looking at. And I want to give you some additional details about all of the all of them, in particular three of them, I think we're going to try to get to today, so that you can see the next level of what's going to come in that day. And man is not going to be ready for it. So with that said, Let's first go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We covered a few specific verses here, which is just talking about the apostasy of man. 
But what I want to share with you briefly is what happens before it. Because what happens before that is kind of an outline that the Lord gives us through the Apostle Paul that tells us basically the, season, uh, the sequence of events. Now, there's going to be different opinions with this as well. And that's that's fine. It's a secondary issue. But I want you to see it for the way it's written. And since I have no reason to doubt any of it, meaning that there's something that's clearly wrong written there, I choose to accept it as it's written. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Paul says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Now, there'll be a group of people that's going to say that's a reference to the rapture, which you'll also find discussed in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. And you're going to have other groups like those that believe in, uh, do not believe in a literal rapture, especially a pre-tribulation rapture. They believe in a mid-trib or even a post-trib. Some go so far as to say there isn't any at all. But based on those that are a pre-tribulation rapture, 2 Thessalonians verse 1, 1 Thessalonians 4.17, I think it's 2 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians, there's a passage as well that seem to indicate that that's going to happen first. Which seems to coincide with the book of Revelation. Because after Jesus talks about the seven churches in chapters two and three, and then after there's the snapshot in heaven regarding the elders and those that are in heaven at that point in time. From that point forward, there is no mention of the church. There is mention of a religion. There's mention of a false church. That is known as the Great Babylon, which we discussed in a previous study. The Great Babylon being a compromised church that worships false gods and idols. And that has the heart and spirit of Babylon behind it. Which is where many of these false gods, false doctrines, and false religions came from. You see, ever since the Tower of Babel, the world has been trying to unite mankind. Thinking if we could just unite mankind under some general beliefs. There'll be peace on earth. But the truth is, without Jesus, there's never going to be any peace. The only thing we could look forward to is wrath and judgment. So that's what Paul says comes first. Then he says, verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by the spirit nor by the sword, nor by letter as from us, as 
that the day of Christ is at hand. Both John and Paul in particular speak of the end of days being right in front of them. That was 2,000 years ago. Where do you think we stand now? I think we're on borrowed time. The day of Christ is at hand. If it was at hand 2,000 years ago, we're right on the edge of it as we speak. Verse 3, Paul says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition in other words before everything heats up for those end of the last day events. According to Paul, that day is not going to come until there comes a great apostasy, a great falling away. This won't just be church attenders. These are going to be church leaders, preachers, false prophets. Kind of like what we're starting to see more and more now. How does apostasy happen? How do you turn away from the truth? Well, one way to do it is to not even refer to the truth. Kind of like not studying the Word of God. Kind of like not even teaching on the Word of God inside of a church. Kind of like not even using your Bible anymore. Which then you can't verify anything that's being said. You can't even address the fact if it's truth or a lie. Because no one's got the whole book memorized. So how do you verify? How do you verify what a Joel Osteen or any minister out there who's compromised, how do you verify what they're saying? How do you verify what's truth and what's not truth? Well, without the word of God, you can't. But the word of God is your final authority. We must have it and use it. Or we're going to be lulled to sleep like the rest of the world. We're going to fall away from the truth fall away from the true faith. Paul is telling us beyond the shadow of a doubt that that time, that coming of that Antichrist is not going to come until there is a great apostasy first. People will have to be turning away from the faith. They have to be rejecting God and his spirit and his son and the atoning work on the cross and the word of God itself. So much so that when they hear a lie, since they don't know the truth and since they've already rejected the truth, they're only going to end up believing the lie.
this apostasy that's coming and that has already started is going to make things so much easier for the enemy. Because people are going to abandon the Lord and his word and the faith. He's not going to have to blind them and sidetrack them. They're already going to be blinded and sidetracked. That's one of the consequences of turning from the truth. Once you have turned away from the truth, and by the way, there's only one truth. Everyone doesn't have their own truth. There's only one truth. And once you turn from that, by definition, the only thing that is left for you to believe is a lie. And that's all we're going to hear. That's all we're going to hear coming from the pulpit. That's all we're going to hear from coming from church hierarchies. That's all we're going to read about. That's all we're going to read in compromised versions of the scripture, which, by the way, we don't need China to write another one for us. We've already got the gay Bible. We have already got a Bible where God is a she. And we've got countless other Bibles that are already corrupted. They're lies. But people are holding to them as truth. That's not going to save them from anything. So the Antichrist is not going to come until first comes the falling away. And once the falling away, in about the middle point of verse 3, it says, except there come a falling away first. Then the man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition. That's the Antichrist. Verse 4, Paul says, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. We've already got religious leaders doing that. Like the Pope like many evangelists, like many pastors from these mega churches that have thousands and thousands of people. It's already happening. Just not as much as it's going to. So he opposes God and he exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So that he as God, look at this now, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you know what that is? That's exactly what the abomination of desolation is. The one that's mentioned in Daniel in at least three places. It's also what Jesus mentions in Matthew 24. Here it is. Paul writes it in the fourth verse of 2 Thessalonians 2. The Antichrist shows himself to be God and he sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God, thereby desecrating the temple. Now, Paul wrote these words. The temple had not yet been destroyed, but it was about to be within a matter of years after Paul's death. But the fact that the Antichrist did not establish his throne and reign in Jerusalem means that this particular event is yet a future event. 
The fact that when Jesus mentions it, he's telling the Jews, if you're out in the field, don't go home. Run. Run for your life. Run for the mountains and hide out in the mountains. Because the enemy is out to destroy you. So that you may not be saved. You may not receive your savior. That's the abomination of desolation. And Paul mentions it without calling it the name. He mentions it exactly the way Daniel does and the way Jesus does. He sets himself up above all that is called God. Remember his last, in Isaiah 14, the fifth thing that Lucifer said? Out of his five I statements, the last one was, I will be like the Most High. That is because he's going to establish his throne in the very temple of God, claiming to be God and desecrating the temple at the same time. Paul says he sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Mentioned in two other places, and probably others, but here it is in black and white for you. I wanted to make sure that you saw that. So, here's the sequence so far in 2 Thessalonians 2. First comes the great apostasy. Then, immediately following the great apostasy, the son of perdition or the Antichrist is revealed. And immediately after he's revealed, he establishes his throne in the temple of God and he claims to be God. Three things in a row that have not yet happened. Verse 5, Paul says, Remember you not that when I was with you, I told you these things? And now you know what withholds that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. And only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. Now Paul clarifies the exact point of the coming of the Antichrist with this portion of 2 Thessalonians 2. But let me clarify one term first that is written here, and it'll make things a lot clearer for you. The word I'm focusing on here is in verse 7. In the King James, it is written, only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. Now, what is he talking about? The original word that has been translated to let, or in the Old English, letteth, is actually a literal term translated as restrains. So let me reread that verse using the word restrains. Verse 7 then says, For the mystery of iniquity does already work, only he who now restrains 
will restrain until he be taken out of the way. What's Paul saying? In light of the fact that it's going to be at this point that the Antichrist is going to be revealed. In addition to the great apostasy, one more thing has to take place. And that is verse 7. Whoever this restrainer is must be taken out of the way before the Antichrist is revealed. Now, why do you think that would be so? It's because of this. This is the enemy's time frame. He will no longer be able to come into the presence of God getting his permission. The Lord is going to let him run with it. That's why it's going to be hell on earth. There's going to be no restraining force on this land. It's going to be like the Wild West, only a thousand times worse. Many believe that the restrainer could be the Holy Spirit. It could be the church, or it could be a combination of the two. After all, the church is made up of born-again, spirit-filled individuals. So if it is the Holy Spirit, for example, how could you just take the Holy Spirit and then leave the church? Because the church, the true church, is filled with the Holy Spirit. So the church is still going to pose a restraining effect in this world that God does not want to have. Because now is the time for wrath and judgment to be poured out. Not withheld. So we don't know exactly which it is, but both the spirit and the church have a restraining effect because the Holy Spirit works through the church. Now, the Holy Spirit is still going to be saving people. We're only talking about his restraining effect in this world so that this world is not as sinful and unholy as it could be. The Holy Spirit, through the church and through his own actions, has a restraining effect on this world. And as bad as it is, it could be worse. Well, there's coming a day where God's word says, that the restraining power is going to be taken out so that there will be no restraint in that day. For those that believe in a pre-trib rapture, this would probably be the time frame of the rapture. It would be after the great apostasy, but it would be before the Antichrist is actually revealed. Now, I know what it says in verse 3. It says that first comes the falling away and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. 
But take a look at verse 8, where Paul clarifies it a little further. And he says, and then shall that wicked be revealed. So when does the wicked one, the Antichrist, get revealed? Well, more specifically than after the apostasy, it would also come after verse 7, which means he will be revealed after the restrainer is taken out of the way so that nothing will hinder his work. And all that follow him will be judged the same way he is. And the wrath and the judgment of God will be poured out at the same time. Now take a look at verse 9. After the wicked one is revealed. Verse 9 says, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. This is what we talked about on Tuesday. The power behind the Antichrist is none other than Satan himself. This is the unholy or two parts of the unholy trinity. In the holy trinity of God, you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In the unholy trinity, you have Satan or Lucifer, you have who is a counterfeit of God, you have the Antichrist who is a counterfeit of Jesus, and you have the false prophet who is a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit. And they will counterfeit everything that the Lord has done. So that people will think that the Antichrist and the power behind him is God. When in reality, it's Satan. Now, if you want to talk about deception, that is going to make any kind of deception that we have already come under seem like nothing. That's what's going to be happening down on earth. From the time that the Antichrist is revealed. And we've already covered the part about what happens to the people that turn away from the truth. And we've already talked about the fact that God himself is going to send a strong delusion. So that these people that have turned away from the truth will find no other way to be saved. If they've rejected the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, then how can one be saved? No religion is going to save you. This is a very key chapter of scripture. None of it has happened yet. Although we are seeing the falling away starting, we're not at the end of it yet. There will be a lot more falling away. We're seeing more of it every single day, aren't we? That's all a precursor. A precursor to the enemy himself. 
So this also gives us evidence in the New Testament of Daniel's writing and even Jesus' writing about the abomination of desolation. This is real. And it's going to be part of the final world religious system. The temple is going to be compromised. The temple is going to be desecrated yet again. I haven't seen anything on it lately, but the last I heard, Israel has everything together and ready to build their temple. They even have the red heifers that are necessary, according to Levitical practices. Just a matter of time. And I wouldn't be surprised for a second if what's going on in Gaza right now is going to open up the door for them to have their temple in the place where the original temple is, which right now belongs to Palestinians. The Lord is going to work something out to give them that land back so that their temple may be built. Maybe it'll be part of their compromising, I'm not sure. But if for nothing else, that temple needs to be there so that the enemy can fulfill the prophetic word that says he will establish his throne in the temple of God and claim to be God. The way things are going, that could happen pretty much at any time. Now let's take a look at an update to where we were in Matthew 24 as well. And then we'll have covered and expanded on our study from Tuesday to see exactly the sequence of events and what the Lord says is going to happen. Please turn with me back to Matthew chapter 24. When we looked at this on Tuesday, we said that verses 4 and forward are all events that are happening now. These are the events pertaining to the birthing pains, wars and rumors of wars, famine, pestilence, earthquake in diverse places. False prophets, false teachers, false Christs. So much so that many shall be offended and they shall betray one another and shall even hate one another. Boy, it was like the Lord was looking at today. And he says in verse 11, there's going to be many false prophets that are going to rise and they're going to deceive even more people. And because of the sin and because of the iniquity in this world, the love of many, Jesus said, is going to grow cold. But then he says that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached unto all nations and then the end will come. And look at what comes in verse 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, there it is, that Daniel spoke about. So even Jesus is referring to Daniel. 
This is when he issues warnings to the Jews. Because we said this is happening in Jerusalem. And while there may be people there that are not from Jerusalem, certainly the majority are. This is going to be happening in the days of the Jews. The days where the Jews are going to be saved and finally receive their Lord and Savior, who they rejected at his first coming. So Jesus warns them immediately following this abomination of desolation. He says, let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Run for your life because the Antichrist is out to destroy you. Flee to the mountains of Judea. If you're on the housetop, don't take anything out of your house. If you're out in the field, don't bother going back home and taking clothes. Get out of there because the enemy is there to make war with you and to destroy you and woe to them that are with child and who give suckling in those days pray that your flight may not be in the winter nor on the sabbath day and then look at what he says in verse 21 for then shall be great tribulation such as not was not since the beginning of the world to this time no nor ever shall be you know what jesus does just with that one verse he makes exactly what paul says in second thessalonians 2 to align perfectly with his sequence of events. You first have the birthing pains. Everyone's heart is going to grow colder. They're going to turn away from the Lord. They're going to turn away from his word. Then the Antichrist is going to come into power. He will be the abomination of desolation. He will establish his throne. He will declare to be God. And it's at that point Jesus says, run for the mountains of Judea and don't look back. Take nothing with you. Just get out of here if you want your life spared. Jesus then refers to it in verse 21 as the great tribulation. The tribulation period is a total of seven years. The first three and a half years that up to the halfway point is known as the tribulation. The second three and a half years, which begins with the revealing of the Antichrist, empowered by satan himself is known as the great tribulation why will it be great well according to second thessalonians 2 because god is going to take the restrainer or restrainers out of the way before the antichrist is revealed here on earth so there will be no restraining power whatsoever he'll be out or the enemy will be out for blood jesus nails it he's not giving us a different message he's giving us the exact same one he even warns people in verse 23 about if any man says there's the Messiah or there's the Christ, he tells them straight out, don't believe it. That's a false Christ. That's a false Messiah. 
and there's going to be false Christs all over the place, he says. And they're going to show you signs and wonders. That was also talked about in 2 Thessalonians. It's just a way of deceiving the people. But I intentionally skipped one verse I want to share with you now. Verse 22. Where Jesus says, And unless those days would be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. It is going to be such a horrendous time on earth. As Jesus already said, unlike anything anyone had ever seen. that unless those days would be cut short, no one, including the elect, would make it to the end. Now with something that is that clearly defined, it kind of makes you wonder, doesn't it? Why people today, including the church, are sound asleep. When they know from God's word what's ahead. Not only is it just ahead, but it's very possible that this may be the generation that sees him. Because there has never been a generation before us that has seen all these things that have been written in God's word regarding future events. And yet for us, we're in the middle of all of it. Birthing pains. The, the beginning of the one world religion. The hearts of man growing cold, man turning away from God, man turning away from the word of God. False Christs everywhere, false prophets everywhere, false gospels everywhere. There's always been some of that. But every single thing Jesus mentioned fits this day. And this is the first generation alive that has seen all these things. And yet the physical church is sound asleep. And man is very busy trading in the truth for a lie. We need to be reminded that the Lord said, look up. Look up for your redemption is near. And we may want to take a look at what we're doing and why we're doing it in the time that remains in this world. Whether it's the end of our own life or whether it's the coming of the Lord, it doesn't matter. First of all, as Peter warns in his epistles, have you made your calling and election sure? Do you know that you are a child of God's? 
Have you been born again? Are you spirit filled? Are you walking in the spirit? Have you denied yourself, taken up your cross and followed him? Or are we going back and forth between what the word of God says and with the things of this world? We don't want to be hanging on to the wrong thing or the wrong things in the day of the Lord's return, do we? Nor do we want to stand before a holy God and to have to try to give an account. For what we have done or not done. Because I don't think any of us would fare very well. We've all had the warnings. And yet even today. The majority of people are turning their back on it. Thinking they've got all the time in the world. Well, with that thought, I have to completely disagree. I do want to show you one more thing in the book of Revelation. Because I promised you I would show you this. And then I'm going to give you a reading assignment for Tuesday. Because there's still more to discuss regarding the enemy. And regarding the end of days. And regarding the sequence of events that Revelation talks about. And how the false prophet works hand in hand with the Antichrist. So before I give you that reading assignment, please turn with me in the book of Revelation to chapter 16. And in chapter 16, let's start in verse 8. And here's what it says. And the fourth angel poured out his vial. This, by the way, are the bold judgments, which are the last series of judgments and the worst of the judgments. The seal ones come first, the trumpet judgments second, then the bold judgments or the vile judgments. This one being the worst. So the fourth angel, verse 8 says, poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. In other words, the temperature of the sun is going to heat up to the point that even people here on earth will be scorched and burned to death from the heat of the sun. Men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, which has power over these plagues. And they repented not to give them to give him glory. Here they are being scorched alive, and they're blaspheming God. And they still refused to repent. Now, is that a hardened heart or what? Verse 10. And the fifth angel 
poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. And his kingdom, that's the Antichrist, was full of darkness. And you ready for this? They gnawed their tongues for pain. The pain was so intense, they gnawed and chewed off their tongue to distract the pain. Verse 11, but they too blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pain and because of their source. And they too repented not of their deeds. This is why I say this period of time is going to be hell on earth. During times of extreme trouble and trial and tribulation in our day or generations before us, when things got really bad, people at least cried out to God. Maybe their repentance wasn't general, uh, genuine. Maybe it was. Only God knows the heart of man. But they at least cried out to him. Not in the days of the Antichrist. They will blaspheme the name of God because of the pain and the torment and the torture that these judgments bring. And on top of blaspheming the name of God, they will still refuse to repent. Where do you go with that? From God's perspective, if you've got men and women turning from the truth and believing a lie, thereby rejecting the only means by which they may be saved, what do you do with that? Other than grant it. Because any false conversion is not going to save them anyhow, right? Well, what about if they're in, in enough turmoil and pain that they're blaspheming the name of God, they're gnawing off their tongue, they're cursing, and yet they still refuse to repent. That's exactly what it's going to look like on this earth. In the near future. It'll be truly unlike anything anyone has ever seen. So if you would... For Tuesday, please read chapter 17 and the beginning of chapter 18, just like maybe the first five or six verses in the book of Revelation. And we will start tying together these loose ends regarding the Antichrist regarding Satan himself. And then we're also going to backtrack to Revelation chapter 13, which is when the Antichrist and the false prophet first come on the scene. In fact, I think that's where we're going to start. And then we'll go into chapter 17 so everything follows sequence. So chapter 13 and chapter 17. And in this way, 
the passages will already be a little familiar to you. Well, let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you, Lord, for these sobering realities that this world is going to face in the near future. After all, several of the apostles said that we've been in the last days for 2,000 years. Everything is starting to change and changing quickly. And the enemy is out to deceive. And since many people are turning away from the word of God and from the Lord himself, it's going to give the enemy a much easier time of deceiving God's people. Including church-going people that are not truly saved. Lord, may we understand exactly where we are in redemptive history. And though we don't know the exact day, Lord, we know that we're in the season. That should be warning enough. All these things that we're studying here for the last few days, Lord, are all just the things regarding the rebellion of the enemy and the rebellion of mankind. And as we ask ourselves the same question every week, with what does that have to do with spiritual warfare? Regarding this particular topic, it has everything to do with it. In future studies, Lord, we'll be taking a deeper look at other passages, as you know that'll add some more things that have everything to do with spiritual warfare that we need to be prepared for. Which means we need to have our weapon, the sword of the spirit, to stand any chance at all. Please guide us and direct us in all things. May it all be for your glory. We thank you, Lord. And we pray this to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. May the Lord bless you in the rest of your day. And we'll be coming back together 